So I've got a 2013 Mac Pro, I've got an eGPU enclosure, and I've got a free afternoon to play with it. And so I thought I'd make a video and answer this question. Can you use an eGPU with the 2013 Mac Pro? And if so, is it worth the investment? Let's find out. What I thought I'd do is split the video into two parts. In this first episode, we'll have a look at what eGPU options are available. And then we'll do a how-to guide on connecting the eGPU to the 2013 Mac Pro. And this should also work for any other Thunderbolt 2 equipped Mac. And finally, I'm going to run a benchmark, which I'll do on the Mac Pro and then also on my MacBook Pro using the same eGPU and graphics card. And that should give us an idea of the difference in performance between Thunderbolt 2 and Thunderbolt 3. In the second episode, I'd like to see how the eGPU performs for uh, video editing and photo editing. And again, I'm going to look at it on both systems, the MacBook Pro and the Mac Pro. Um, but what I really need is a couple of weeks to really have a good play with that. So um, that episode will come a little bit later on. For now, though, let's get started. What options do we have when it comes to eGPU? Essentially, there's really only two routes. Either you buy an enclosure that already has a graphics card in it, and often those can't be upgraded, or you buy a separate enclosure and put your own graphics card in it. So let's take that first option. Now, you've got companies like Sonnet who make something called the Breakaway Puck, and this is a, a smaller eGPU that's ideal for toting around with your laptop. It fits in your laptop bag. Now, you do still need to plug it in, but uh, it's a nice small device that gives you a bit of extra graphics power. Now notice on their website, it comes with an RX 560 graphics card in. But again, as far as I'm aware, you can't change that GPU once you've bought it. A 560 would be a pretty great upgrade for, say, a MacBook Air or an entry-level MacBook Pro. Uh, but it's not going to set the world alight, obviously, uh, and probably wouldn't be worth considering for a Mac Pro. So we might want to look at the Blackmagic eGPU. And again, you can't upgrade the graphics cards in these eGPUs. They're closed systems. And there are two on offer. One has the RX 580 graphics in it, and uh, the other one has a Vega 64 card. Now, these are expensive solutions. Uh, there's something that uh, Blackmagic created specifically for Apple, and they look really nice. It's a lovely design, but it's much more expensive than buying an enclosure and a graphics card separately. However, the Blackmagic eGPU does have one key advantage, and that is that it has Thunderbolt 3 pass-through. So if you're using a Thunderbolt monitor, then you're going to need one of those Blackmagic eGPUs. The second option is to buy your own enclosure and then choose whichever graphics card you like, provided that it's supported by Mac OS. And just to be clear here, that means AMD cards only. There are no NVIDIA drivers anymore for Mac. There's uh, some stupid squabble going on between Apple and NVIDIA, so that's not likely to happen anytime soon. Fortunately for us, AMD have been producing some pretty great GPUs of late. Now, there are a number of different options to look at when it comes to enclosures. And you can have a look on Apple's website and see which different enclosures they recommend. I personally went with the Razer Core X. Now, there are two versions of this. There's the standard Core X, which comes with a 600 watt power supply. And then there's the Core X Chroma, which is the one that I have here. Uh, this has a 700 watt power supply. It also has four USB 3 ports, an ethernet socket, and RGB lighting. But there are some caveats with this. First of all, Razer don't make any software for macOS to control the RGB lighting. So all it does is a, a color cycle. That's not why I went with this particular model. I, I couldn't care less about RGB lighting. Uh, what I particularly wanted was the USB ports and the ethernet socket. And the USB ports, they work great, but the ethernet socket doesn't work very well at all with macOS. So the chipset that's being used for this particular ethernet card uh, doesn't have driver support within macOS. You can download a driver from Razer's website, but I found it's incredibly flaky. It'll work and then it'll just stop working. Uh, so you can't rely on it. I'm pretty disappointed about that. And I don't feel that Razer have been particularly forthcoming with that information on their website. Nonetheless, I'm not unhappy with my purchase. I don't necessarily need the ethernet socket and the eGPU is pretty fantastic. It's a well-made thing. I love the way that you can just slide out the internals and then there's space to put in a decent sized graphics card. I'll put the measurements for the maximum size of graphics card up on the screen. Now I chose to install in mine this Sapphire RX 5700 XT Nitro Plus, and this is the special edition that has 
uh, a bit of overclocking applied to it, and it has the RGB lighting. Again, as far as I'm aware, there's no software in macOS to control the RGB lighting, so it is what it is. The card has three DisplayPort outputs and an HDMI output, and it has eight gigabytes of video RAM. The RX 5700 XT is one of the newer generation AMD cards with the Navi architecture. macOS does have drivers for this. I don't think they're completely optimized yet, but I suspect that will happen very soon because you can now buy the 2019 Mac Pro with a version of the 5700 graphics card. So that's just a quick overview of eGPUs. Obviously, there are plenty of different enclosures available. Choose the one that suits you, choose the graphics card that you want, and you're ready to go. Now, officially, Apple supports eGPU on any of the Thunderbolt 3 equipped Macs. Uh, but of course, the 2013 Mac Pro doesn't have Thunderbolt 3. It's a Thunderbolt 2 computer. So first of all, how are we going to connect the eGPU to the Mac Pro? Well, we're going to use Apple's Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3 adapter. Now, these are not massively expensive. Uh, you've got a uh, Thunderbolt 3 plug there at the end and a socket for Thunderbolt 2, so you'll also need a Thunderbolt 2 cable. Now, this particular adapter is bi-directional, so it means you can connect a Thunderbolt 3 device to a Thunderbolt 2 equipped computer or a Thunderbolt 2 device to a Thunderbolt 3 equipped computer. Uh, there is just one thing to be aware of, and that is that the adapter will only pass power through one way. So if you're connecting a Thunderbolt 2 device to a Thunderbolt 3 equipped computer, then the adapter will pass power through to the device. Uh, if you're doing it the other way around and you're trying to attach a Thunderbolt 3, say an external SSD or something like that, to a Thunderbolt 2 equipped computer, you'll find it doesn't work. So with this simple cable solution, we can connect our eGPU to the Mac Pro. But of course, since Apple doesn't officially support it, we're going to need some third-party assistance. And the third-party support that we're going to be using is a script called Purge Wrangler. When you run this script on your Mac, it detects the graphics card that you're using, uh, it patches the drivers for that into the operating system kernel, and basically enables eGPU support. The slight issue with that is that since El Capitan, all Macs have had something called System Integrity Protection. And what this does is it stops applications from overwriting the operating system kernel on any core files, even if you type in your password. That's why when you do an update for your Mac, it will reboot itself as part of that process so that it can get around this security restriction. Now we can turn off system integrity protection. And indeed, that's what we're going to have to do to install Purge Wrangler. Now, does this mean that it makes our Mac less secure? Are we opening ourselves up to vulnerabilities by doing this? Well, you could argue, yes, it will be less secure. But in reality, unless you're one of those people that likes to download software from weird and wonderful places on the internet and uh, just install it randomly, uh, type in your password whenever you're asked for it, that kind of thing, then yes, you might have a problem. But for regular people installing reputable software, it shouldn't cause you any problems. However, proceed at your own risk. So that's the theory covered off. Let's get the Mac Pro plugged in and we'll run through the setup process together. So I've got the Mac Pro set up, we're ready to go. The first thing we need to do is disable that system integrity protection. And we do that by booting the computer into restore mode. So we hold down Command and R on the keyboard as we switch the computer on in order to achieve that. It does take a little while to boot into restore mode. Now, once we've booted up, we'll be prompted to select our language. And this does look a lot like a software installation screen, but uh, don't worry, it isn't. So we'll just select English UK in my case. So from here, we can go up to the utilities menu, come down to select terminal. So now we've got our terminal window open, we can issue the command to disable system integrity protection. And that command is csrutil space disable. If you wanted to switch it back on again, you would use csrutil space enable. Uh, but just something to bear in mind here is that once you've patched the operating system kernel, you won't be able to re-enable system integrity protection. If you do that, you'll find your Mac won't boot up. It is perfectly easy to uninstall the Purge Wrangler script, and then you can re-enable system integrity protection. Just something to bear in mind. So let's press the button and see what happens. So we just simply get a message that says successfully disabled system integrity protection. Please restart the machine for the changes to take effect.
So we're going to do the restart of the machine, but it's important that we don't yet plug in our eGPU. Now to restart, we could just issue the reboot command to the terminal window. OK, so we're ready to download and install the Purge Wrangler script. And we can do that by copying and pasting the command from the installation website. So if we do a little search for Purge Wrangler, you find this GitHub page. That's the correct page to go to. So this is the source code project here. And if we scroll down and you see a link there to the project wiki. So if we click on that, you'll notice there's a beginner's guide. And in here, we can run through the entire process. You'll see that step 2A that we've just done with our disabling of system integrity protection. Uh, next, we're going to install Purge Wrangler, and you'll see that we've got this command that we can copy and paste straight into a terminal window. So to open a terminal, I've got mine down in the dock here, but you'll find it in the Applications folder. Um, and there's a shortcut, actually. If you just uh, tap on your desktop, so you've got Finder as your app, and then press Command Shift U on the keyboard, and that'll open your Utilities folder, which is inside your Applications folder. Then just double click on Terminal, and we've got a terminal window up. Let's make that a little bigger. We'll just paste in that command that we just copied. Press Enter. It's going to ask us for our password. And it downloads the script and runs it straight away. And we just simply want to now go to option one to set up the eGPU. Now, at this point, it's going to ask us to plug in our eGPU. And you might want to try that. But in my case, it causes a, a system crash. So we're not going to plug in the eGPU. We'll just wait for that to time out. OK, so the auto detection, it says failed. Well, we just uh, we didn't plug in the eGPU, so it didn't stand a chance. There does seem to be a bug in the auto detection for some of the latest graphics cards, which is what mine is. We won't enable TI-82 support. This is specifically for eGPU enclosures that are not officially supported by Apple. But in our case, the Razer Core X is supported by Apple. Our eGPU vendor is AMD, so we'll choose number one. Then it asks us if we want to enable legacy AMD support. Uh, that doesn't really apply. We've got one of the latest graphics cards, so I'm just going to say no to that. And the script now does its work. OK, and that's it. We're finished. So we're now being asked to reboot. What's important here is that we don't plug in the eGPU yet. We'll just let the system reboot and come back up. Now, I've already connected the Thunderbolt 3 to Thunderbolt 2 adapter into the eGPU. And I've run a Thunderbolt 2 cable from the Mac Pro. So all I've got to do is connect the two things together. And hopefully it doesn't crash again. It looks to me like that's worked. So what we're looking for when the eGPU is connected is this little icon in the, in the top tray up here that looks like a, a little computer chip. And if we click on that, we can see that we are indeed now connected to the AMD Radeon RX 5700 XT that's in the eGPU enclosure. You notice also on the desktop that all of my disks uh, from my storage array have appeared, and that's because they're plugged in via USB into the eGPU. So we can see that that's working as well. Now, if I go to the system preferences and then uh, look at displays, what you'll see is that my computer thinks that I have two displays. But as you can see, I, I only have one monitor. The reason for this is that I currently have the Mac Pro plugged into the display via a DisplayPort cable, and the eGPU is plugged into the display via an HDMI cable. So I can actually switch between the two using my monitor. So I could uh, just come down and select the HDMI. And we should see a different desktop picture. There we go. So that's the eGPU display. So let's flick back to DisplayPort. Obviously, having two connections into one monitor isn't particularly convenient, but I just want to leave it connected for a moment just to show you uh, how you make the eGPU your primary monitor. So you see on the arrangement window here, we've got this white bar. And that indicates which is the primary display, or in other words, where your dock primarily gets displayed. And if we want to make the other display our primary, we just simply drag it over, drag that white bar across, as you can see. 
Now, the reason why the two displays appear to be different sizes is because I'm running display scaling uh, on the DisplayPort connection so that it appears like a, an HD display, 1080p, but this is actually a 4K monitor. So what will make the most sense is for me to just simply unplug the DisplayPort and then it will only be the eGPU that's connected to the Mac Pro and we'll only be using that HDMI connection. So let me do that now. So my DisplayPort cable is unplugged as you can see and we still have a picture on the screen and that's coming from the eGPU. So it is in fact working just fine. So to make this a bit easier to see, I'm just gonna scale the resolution on this screen as well. Uh, 4K is great, but when you're sat right in front of the monitor, it's a lot of moving of the mouse. And of course, because we've only got one screen connected now, this will be our primary display. Now, this is one of the things that you need to know about eGPU usage. Whichever screen your app is running on, it will use that graphics card to accelerate. So for example, if we run an app on the eGPU display, then it will be accelerated by the eGPU. But if we open up an app and run it on a screen that's connected to your Mac Pro via DisplayPort, then it's going to be using the internal graphics cards of the Mac Pro. Now we should also just cover off some other limitations of eGPU. Uh, when you have a graphics card plugged in natively into your computer using PCI Express, you get the benefit of all of that bandwidth. But we're trying to run that over Thunderbolt, which has much less bandwidth. And Thunderbolt 2 has considerably less bandwidth than Thunderbolt 3, uh, roughly half, in fact. So there are some quirks to the way that the eGPU behaves. And it is true that you will not get the maximum performance out of any graphics card that you're connecting via an eGPU. Now, some people believe that Thunderbolt 2 is completely incapable of supporting eGPU because there just isn't sufficient bandwidth. We're going to prove that wrong in a moment. Because of these limitations, eGPUs always work best if they're connected directly to a display. Now just think about this. Your computer is sending all that information over the Thunderbolt cable to the graphics card in the eGPU. If the graphics card can then simply send it straight to the display, that's the most efficient use of the bandwidth. If instead you're trying to accelerate the internal screen of say an iMac or a MacBook Pro, then all of that data has to come back down the cable. On an older Mac running Thunderbolt 2, that's not going to work. So for instance, if you had an iMac equipped with Thunderbolt 2 and you were hoping to accelerate the internal display, uh, I think you're on a hiding to nothing there. Let me just quickly show you something else as well that exists in Mac OS. If we select any uh, program application, if we right click, go to Get Info, what you'll see is that there's an option there to prefer the external GPU. Uh, this option only appears when you have an eGPU connected, um, although I think macOS will remember your choice on that. So if you've got an eGPU connected and you've got an app that you always want to run on your accelerated display, you can tick that box and it should always then open up on the correct display. Now, the benchmark that I'm going to run in this episode is the Unigine Valley benchmark. Now this particular benchmark is really representative of gaming performance, but it is a useful benchmark to run because it shows you what the eGPU can be capable of. And it also will highlight some limitations. So I've set the thing up to run at uh, 1080p resolution in ultra settings with anti-aliasing turned up to the max. And then we'll just run the benchmark and we'll see what score we get. Once we've done the Mac Pro, we'll do the same thing with the MacBook Pro using the same eGPU and graphics card. And what that will do is uh, give us an indication of the performance drop-off between Thunderbolt 3 on the MacBook Pro and Thunderbolt 2 on the Mac Pro. So let's give it a go. I'm currently running at over 70 frames per second on this. You can see that the GPU is now starting to work, the fans are spinning up. If you can hear any machine work noises in the background, uh, attached to this uh, garden office is my dad's workshop and he's, uh, he makes classical guitars actually. Uh, he's busy making one of those at the moment. Uh, now that might sound odd actually for a chap in his 40s to say that his dad's working next door. Uh, yes, I do in fact live with my parents, but it's not quite as bad as it sounds. Uh, we bought a house together actually at the end of last year. Um, quite a big place that we're able to each have our own individual spaces, but by combining our money together, we got a, a lot more for our money and we get to live in a very nice place. 
So we're about halfway through the benchmark at the moment and it's uh, still keeping steady at about 75 frames per second. Even without seeing the result of the benchmark, you can see that using an eGPU with the Mac Pro definitely works. Uh, there's no way that you'd get this kind of performance off of the internal D300s on this Mac. Uh, even the D700s wouldn't be able to achieve this. And part of the reason for that, of course, is because the benchmark would only ever use one of those graphics cards anyway. Okay, there's our final score. We got uh, an average frames per second of 68.8, and that gives us a score of uh, 2,880. So I just started another benchmark going, still at 1080p, but this time I've set the quality to low and I've turned the anti-aliasing down. And I want to show you this performance because it highlights one of the quirks of eGPU. So the results are in, and uh, the reality is it's scored virtually the same as what it did before. We've got 71.4 frames per second and a score of 2,989. And this is despite the fact that we've gone from ultra settings all the way down to low, and we switched off anti-aliasing. Now, why should this be the case? Think about how the eGPU is working. The computer is sending data through the Thunderbolt cable to the eGPU, and the data that it's sending is geometric data and textures. It's then up to the eGPU to process that data and to make the 3D image, which it then sends directly out to the monitor. So the limitation is not the performance of the graphics card, it's the speed at which the computer can get the data to the eGPU. So we're not able to utilize the full power of the graphics processor because we're not physically able to get enough data to it. Now for gaming, this isn't particularly a problem because what it means is that you're gonna get a consistently decent frame rate uh, no matter what your settings are and what your game is. What would be good now is to run the same benchmarks on the MacBook Pro so that we can compare the difference between Thunderbolt 2 and Thunderbolt 3. Now Thunderbolt 2 has half the bandwidth of Thunderbolt 3, so does that mean that we'll see double the performance with the MacBook Pro? Well, let's find out. In order to do that, of course, we need to disconnect ourselves from the eGPU and shut down the machine properly. So all we need to do is go up to that icon in the top corner and select disconnect for the eGPU. Um, obviously, we've got our USB devices plugged into the eGPU, so we probably want to eject those first, so that's nice and clean. And we also want to plug the DisplayPort cable back into the Mac Pro. Now this is one of the downsides of eGPU usage, that you kind of need to go through this process when you're starting up your machine and when you're shutting it down. Uh, I've never found it possible to just leave the eGPU plugged in, switch on the computer and have it work. Uh, that's never worked for me anyway. So let's just go through that process, then we'll get the MacBook Pro out and get set up with that. Okay, so I've got my MacBook Pro 13 inch plugged in. I've got it on this uh, lovely Mac Alley stand here. So I connect the MacBook Pro to the eGPU and then I just close the lid. And that means that everything is now going straight to the main display here. And I've set up the same benchmark using the same settings. So we're going with 1080p, ultra, and eight times anti-aliasing. Okay, so the benchmark is now finished and the results are 83.7 frames per second and a score of 3,501. Now, if you remember the uh, Mac Pro scored 68.8 frames per second and a score of 2,880 on the same settings. So I'm just doing some quick calculations here, but uh, if my calculations are correct, that means that the Mac Pro, so the Thunderbolt 2 connection gets about 82% of the performance of Thunderbolt 3. So there is definitely a significant drop off in performance from Thunderbolt 3 to Thunderbolt 2. But it's certainly not the orders of magnitude that you might expect, considering that Thunderbolt 2 only has half the available bandwidth. Now, of course, it would be even more useful if we knew the performance of the graphics card itself, if it was plugged into PCI Express inside the computer. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a Mac Pro 5.1 or 7.1 in which to insert this graphics card to test it but I do have a gaming PC that has a 5700 XT in it. And you can run the Unigy and Valley test in Windows as well. So I was careful to select the OpenGL API because that's what's being used for these Mac benchmarks. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, the PC scored 92.8 frames per second and got a score of 3,882. So you can see the performance drop off from PCI Express down to Thunderbolt 3 is not as large as you might think. 
It is worth saying though that of course running this test on Windows is not the same as running it on a Mac. And, and if you run the benchmark again using the DirectX API, then the card actually scores 108.4 frames per second and scores uh, 4,535, which just serves to underline the point that Windows is the appropriate platform for gaming. Mac just can't keep up. That said, bear in mind that this benchmark was using OpenGL and not Apple's Metal framework. And that's because the benchmark was created back in 2013. Um, but it's just a convenient benchmark that runs on both Mac and Windows. And I wanted to give you that comparison with the gaming PC as well, because I think it's an interesting comparison and it helps us to see the overall performance of the eGPU. So we can start to draw some conclusions about eGPU usage. Uh, just bearing in mind the structure of how the thing is set up and the fact that it's uh, sending data through that cable, if we're sending data to the GPU and it's going straight to the display, then it's quite an optimal situation. When we start to consider professional apps, how is it going to perform? Now for image editing, you would expect that it would be a similar scenario to gaming, where the GPU will help to accelerate the display. But when it comes to video editing, we've got a couple of different scenarios here. Uh, first of all, the eGPU will help with the timeline performance because it's rendering that information straight to the display. So it can decode a video in real time and give us a nice smooth editing experience. But when it comes to rendering the video, then bear in mind that data has got to go to the GPU and then back to the computer. So we may find that the performance benefit is not as much when it comes to rendering. Now, I really need a few weeks just to play around with this, particularly as Final Cut Pro seems to not play very nicely with eGPU, on the Mac Pro that is. Uh, it works quite well with the MacBook Pro, uh, certainly accelerates and I found that editing video on the MacBook Pro with the eGPU is a good experience. Uh, I've had very mixed results doing it with the Mac Pro, so I'd like to do a bit more testing on that. So I'm going to do some testing in Final Cut Pro. Uh, I may even get some DaVinci Resolve testing done because uh, I am starting to learn that particular piece of software. I'm also going to try a few things in Affinity Photo, perhaps trying to run some various benchmarking tasks and comparing again between the Mac Pro and the MacBook Pro. If you're thinking of buying an eGPU for your Mac Pro, make sure you do your homework. Obviously, you're not going to get maximum performance out of any graphics card over Thunderbolt 2. And you need to analyze your workload and consider how it will work with an eGPU and whether you think you'll get a benefit. Uh, the eGPU makes much more economic sense if you also have a laptop that you'd like to accelerate, uh, because then you can use the one device like I do for both computers, and that effectively halves the cost of it. So it's a big outlay, so you need to weigh up all of these different things to decide whether it's for you. However, what we have done is answered the question of, is it possible to use an eGPU with a 2013 Mac Pro? or indeed any Thunderbolt 2 equipped Mac? And the answer is yes, and it's not difficult to do either. However, I will say that the implementation with the Mac Pro running Catalina is flaky. You will get times where the system crashes. Um, I've had two or three crashes today uh, as a result of playing around with this. Uh, once you've got it running and you're actually using it, it seems to be pretty stable. Uh, but I think my recommendation, as always, for the 2013 Mac Pro is if you don't need Catalina, stick with Mojave. It seems to have less of these issues. So that's it for this video and this little dive into the eGPU usage with the Mac Pro. In the next episode, of course, we'll get into those professional applications. Um, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, please click the button and hit the bell icon, and then you'll be notified when I release that episode. As always, if uh, you've got a question that you'd like to pose or you've got something to share, please put it in the comments section. I really love reading your comments and I try to respond to as many as I possibly can. And hopefully I've done enough to earn a thumbs up. In any case, I'll see you next time for some more Geekery.